everyone again. Please join. And I'm very glad to introduce uh, our guest who traveled recently across the sea and tell about the new home. Oleg? Yeah, so this is all correct. This is all correct. Uh, but first, before I start talking, I'll actually show something that I have. So I indeed traveled across the pond, and uh, I have some goodies, so these are t-shirts. And um, unlike m in most times, these are S and M, so they, it's, it's not a, like a sleeping t-shirt, these are proper t-shirts. And even better, I have ladies t-shirts, I'm looking at you ladies. I'll give that away, um, but not, well, I mean, I'm not give that away, I won't give that away, I'll swap that for questions. So if you want to get t-shirts, you have to think about the question. I'll hide that for now, and, and now we'll start. Now we'll start. So, I'm a little bit nervous and a little bit worried since that's my first talk since I joined King. Before that, it's like, like it's seven years in the industry. For the last four years, I've been travel traveling around the world and talking on behalf of uh, different companies from games industry, mostly Unity actually. And um, now it's King. So, yeah. Um, and it's especially cool that my debut talk is happening here in Vilnius. And that's the town I kind of call a hometown. And um, so yeah, let's start. Boom, and it didn't work. Yes, it did. Yeah, so we'll talk today about well, um, about King, about King's new game engine, about games tool, tools and middleware industry overall will answer a very complex question of why would the world need another game engine. We'll talk about the processes inside the King. How do we do the game engine? How do we do games? And yeah, so... Um, one note here that, uh, well, I mentioned that like Vilnius is the town I kind of call the hometown. I traveled here from Minsk in 2009 to work for Unit Technologies. I was employee number three or four here in Vilnius office. And that was employee about 21st or 22nd globally. And I guess you all know what Unity is, right? Like you all use Unity probably, or at least tried, or at least used. And uh, yeah, today Vilnius office is, Unity's Vilnius office is 60 devs. So that's a cool thing. And um, I mean, my bio for this conference says that uh, I care about Lithuania. So this small pitch was kind of um, like, resembles that I do care uh, about Vilnius, about Unity, and um, and this slide. So yeah, indeed the talk was supposed to be about, about default and about King and about the game industry, but it's impossible to talk about games industry, about uh, like overall, like be it a games middleware industry, be it about um, games tools, game studios, game dev industry without mentioning Unity. After all, I mean like Unity, that's the tool everyone uses, or at like either at work or at home. It, it, Unity has millions of users, mm, universities across the globe, including Lithuania, they teach Unity, like that's a standard tool to make games. And uh, Unity has great tools, I mean, Everyone knows that. And recently Unity stated that Unity owns 30% of top 1,000 mobile game downloads. Think about that. 30%. Now, is it a lot or is it not a lot? So 30% is a lot, but then it's 70% rest, right? Like, what is this 70%? Actually, what do you guys think, or girls? Like, Who's, who rivals Unity in this space, like, right? Who owns this 70%? Any guesses? Come on, like, what's on top of your head? Smaller companies. Smaller companies. Like, um, I mean, uh, I'm talking about um, what tools do they use to make games? Like, what, what tools are used to make this 70% of the top 1,000 games in the mobile space? 
in house. So I mean that 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 was too boring. I mean this guy's just too smart. <laughs> okay, I, I won't play this game anymore. I thought this would this would yeah. So this is correct. Actually, uh, it's homebrew. So in order to create a game, games like this one, right, the game that's going to be downloaded in millions, um, you have to use homebrew technologies, um, like get libgdx or whatever other library you have or you find or your developers like love and um, make an agent out of that and exactly that so um, if you look into top 10 or top 20 or top 30 games on the mobile space you would find one maybe two unity games and there is a good reason for that if you want to your game to be downloaded in, in millions. Well, first, that's going to be a free-to-play game, right? I mean, no one has any doubts about that. And in free-to-play space, the game size has to be very small. The game has to load very fast because, I mean, uh, when we're talking about free-to-play games, we're, we're thinking about, you know, these uh, five-minute uh, toilet sessions, right? So when you have five minutes to play the game, you ha the game has to load instantly, levels has, uh, have to switch instantly. So you have to use this heavily optimized technologies. And also, you have to up update these games very often, as in supply new levels, supply new content, maybe weekly, maybe bi-weekly, or, you know, monthly, at least. Um, you would have, you know, a Christmas update, Easter update, um, uh, St. Patrick's Day, Day update, just like poor, poor, poor new content. So your users, they, they, um, so they don't forget about your game. And again, that's where you need these um, homebrew technologies that are tackled best to a specific game, to a specific title. And at King, we actually use these homebrew technologies as well. So, uh, for example, Candy Crush Saga, uh, it uses a fiction factory game engine that's a game engine that was uh, built inside. Then uh, there are other internal technologies that King uses to make games. And I mean, King is a bunch of, it's, it's actually tens of studios, of smaller studios. I mean, they're still King studios, but they all like kind of independent. They, they use some common stack, but are, otherwise the studios are independent. So they all sit and make games, and these are exactly these games that are targeted to be highly profitable. The games that are targeted at these casual players who would download, who would want this fast performance. And uh, when we're talking about casual players, we're thinking globally. And here in Lithuania, where phones are sub sub subsidized, or in Western Europe, when, or in the US, um, everyone can afford an iPhone or, or a top-end Android because, I mean, seller carriers just offer these deals. But in other parts of the world, people use very low-end devices. And suddenly, uh, the games need to be heavily optimized for this crappy, you know, low-end devices, and the games have to perform that, because these players, this, they still play these casual games, and actually uh, low-end device owners are even more likely to play these um, games. So you have to target that. And that's, again, that's yet another reason to use these highly optimized engines that you build in-house. So what I am to talk now about is about one of these highly optimized game engines that we built inside. Uh, so default game engine. Default game engine is an engine that has been uh, in production for two years. It has um, a bunch of games released, both King, uh, inside of King and outside of King. And, um, and it has been released publicly um, last GDC, so that's one and a half months ago, so six-ish weeks ago. And here's a, he, he, here would be the question. Um, well, I mean, obviously, I can talk like, why would King want to release 
this internal game engine? Why would King want to be to become this industry player? And more importantly, why is this game engine free? But so these are common questions, and I did answer that um, before lots of times. You can read articles about that on VentureBeat, on Wired, and everywhere in the internet. And the question that unites these trivial why questions is why would the world need another game engine? Right? So everyone around the world uses different game engines, uses Unity, like all other tools, and are well quite happy in what they're doing. Why would the world need a new game engine? And the question is, well, I mean, well, they don't need, the world does need, like they use something and they care about making games. There is like an asterisk, however, however, the world wouldn't need another game engine unless this game engine has a unique proposition no one else is able to offer. As in the game engine that solves problems that aren't solved, the problems that are unique for this fast-growing and fast-changing industry. And we believe that we have just that. The unique proposition for default is that that's a kind of common stack for King. That's, and King, again, is a company that has multiple studios working on these games. And as a game studio, I mean, I see lots of people from game studios here, right? You don't, like, as a game studio, the only goal, the only mi milestone that you have is to ship the game. To ship the game and then to update it with new content, and this should be fast, this should be fit efficient. So, and when you're a middleware company, as in company working on games tools, and when you don't make games yourself, you invest more money and more time in the tools you're making, I mean, if you're not making games, you understand tools. If you're making games, you understand what does it take to release a game. You know, that last mile. They say in this industry that first 80% of making a game is much easier than the second 80% when you're making a game. And second 80% is actually this last mile. Like, when you think like, okay, my game is almost done, now we have to polish it, pack it, and ship it. And this is, again, this is 80%. And that's, that's what we believe we have fixed it. The Blossom Blast Saga game, that's a Saga franchise game that is built on default. You can check it out, you can see how it performs. That's a kind of flagship-ish game for the engine for at the moment. Community-wise, you can check out Hammer Witch Coliseum game. Uh, that's a non-king game that has been uh, built on default. It was instantly featured by Apple. So apparently Apple loves the game engine and loves the way it per performs, loves the way it uh, works on especially lower and, and, and uh, older iPhones. So, all in all, sh um, the engine is designed for that last mile for shipping, shipping the game. Not for making the game, but for shipping the game. And uh, there is a video now. I hope they're going to be sound. I hear a sound. Yeah. So, uh, next I'm going to talk about the internal processes. But I wanted to show you the office where the engine and the games are created. That's the second so King's overall, office. Since we built the last office, King has kept growing. We've added so much great talent to the company. And I think as we grow, we need to create more space. So instead of kind of carrying the baggage of the past, uh, we wanted to have an environment whereby you, know, you get a clean slate in your head and you can then work forward without any kind of restraints. When people come down here the first time, everybody's like, oh my god, you have a forest. I think the forest is amazing. Um, I think the forest is mind-blowing. You come in and it's like you're being hugged by the, the actual studio, which is an incredible feeling. 
central space around here is really, really cozy and calm. For me, as a producer, I need space where I can uh, think, where I can explore. Having this calm area, it sort of oozes energy. There are a lot of spaces in general where you can go. It's not only the forest. We have the meeting rooms, we have small different areas where you can actually go. There's a lot of places for people to meet for more intimate conversations or kind of brainstorming sessions that are really useful and, and, and fruitful if, if looking for new ideas. The cool thing is that all the projections on the ground are actually interactive, so when you walk on them it'll like make some kind of sound as if you're, you're walking through water or you're walking on ice. The purpose of the forest at K36 was to create an area where nothing is basically required of you. You don't have to produce, you can just sit and just be yourself. And in those moments of pause, I think, is when the greatest creative things happen. I, I think it's an interesting office because we're in the middle of town, it's really a buzzy area of Stockholm. And at the same time when you come into the office, it's, very, it's a calm, great environment to work and concentrate in. So I think you get that blend of a, a great place to be and a great place to work. So yeah, this is the environment that the game engine and some of the King's games are, are created. And some of you, I see Alan, I see Christy who's been there. So yeah, uh, so it's not just a fake video. It's, 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 it's actually, the office does exist. Um, I wanted to show that in order to, um, to explain the processes. And that's the process of slide. It's not something that I use an artist to create. It's something uh, that they just took a picture of. Um, I, 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 I tried to, do, to think, OK, so when talk about the processes, um, internal process at King, like what, what, what they used to visualize that. And that's just a whiteboard that we use for Scrum. So apparently, we have a Batman and Robin. Um, Batman was sick, so um, uh, Robin actually took care about stuff that the Batman should have cared. So the processes. Imagine the loop at, a, um, say, middleware company that that creates a tool. So there are external users. And there is like a core team creating the tool. When external user, be it a Unity user or you know other middleware user, like finds a bug and is like, oh, okay, this is a blocker. I mean, I cannot work anymore. So he or she reports a bug. Then that bug gets to like some QA queue. Someone has to process that queue, assess the bug, reproduce the bug, maybe assign to a programmer. Then the programmer has to fix the bug, and then it gets. Like again, back to the tester, so the tester can figure out if the bug was reproduced. Then, if it's all okay, it gets to the alpha, then it gets to the beta, then it gets shipped. So, from the moment when external user has reported the bug to a moment when that user gets a fix, can take, you know, months. So, that's the, the problem. And also, the conversation between users and the core team happens via you know bug reports maybe via forums or something and um, you as a developer of the tool you always you know you don't know like how to assess that feedback if the user is really skillful or is um, uh, the feedback that user is providing maybe that feedback is not relevant so you you have to you don't have meaningful tools to assess, to assess that feedback and to prioritize that. Here, as you've seen, there is like a forest, which is a common area. Otherwise, there is an isolated space where the engine team resides and when the engine users reside internal at King. Meaning that when something, when, when someone is not happy about default, they took a time walk 20 meters, poke a programmer and say, look, my texture is 47 megabytes. And this is, you know, like a, just, just an atlas, what happens? And then they calculate and then they figure out that alpha doesn't compress well and then they figure out that mid maps get calculated and then the program, programmer immediately and said, oh shit, okay, I gotta fix that immediately. 
Um, internal processes are two weeks to the beta, another two weeks uh, like to get, mm, for the software to get shipped. So whatever happens, each two weeks something gets to the beta, then the beta graduates as final. These are internal processes, and this is actually how it happened to be in the real world, like when we release the tool to public, the processes uh, stayed the same. So we use Scrum, two weeks, two weeks Scrum. Then we have uh, so-called prioritization meetings. As in, so we have Ingela, uh, who is a product owner. Uh, she's also a Scrum master. She's also a producer for default. So she's the interface between the engine programmers and um, King's teams who use default. So she meets all the stakeholders within King teams who complain about the engine, who have the feedback. And uh, you have to be either like vocal and proactive or a studio lead to provide the feedback, which results like anyone can do that. And then there are these prioritization meetings, as in, Everyone, you know, has um, like feature requests and bugs. Um, they like watch into the screen with Jira in Scandinavia. In Scandinavia, they call this Jira because apparently they cannot pronounce some sounds. I guess. And um, the main question normally is: So, who's shipping? When are you shipping? Right, so if, for example, like an artist says, oh, I mean, I cannot use this, it's, it's not convenient. I, 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 let me try to, to, to do this with Scandinavian accent. Like, this is not convenient, <laughs> right? So, and um, the question is, when are you shipping? We're, sh we're shipping in summer, right? So then this goes later. And whoever is shipping like within the next months, they get the highest priority. And then um, they asked, like, Oleg, what's the community feedback? And I have to, pr to provide the community feedback. So that's how it gets prioritized. Internal teams, they have, like, own game shipping milestones and, and, uh, and schedules. They use default, like, full time. Um, and that's how the tools get, get shaped. And I am the community voice. So, for example, community really needed Steam support, and King doesn't release games on Steam, you know, for the moment. So, for example, to get a Steam into the to the list into Yira, um, someone has to vote for that. So that is me. So community complains into me. I like get stuff um, into the pipeline. So. Now you can understand that, okay, so this game engine is basically whatever Kings is cool at, that's where the game engine, this particular game engine is cool at. Um, I guess this is all I wanted to say about this thing. Mm. What about Batman and Robin? Do you know who they are? No, no, I mean like scrum wise. Do, do you scrum in your teams? Right, okay. So the Batman and Robin, this is actually like one, one of the scrum approaches. And uh, basically whoever, um, okay, let me explain that. Normally there are tasks that's someone is supposed to do, but no one does, because that's no one's role. For example, to reply to user questions on the forum. So whose role is that? The questions are technical. So for example, it's a developer who has to reply to that. But then developers are busy actually doing stuff that is in Jira. And um, in order kind of to explain who does this extra work, uh, there is this role as Batman and Robin. Batman, like, is uh, who is supposed to do, and Robin is kind of fallback. So, for example, in this case, this was exactly the problem that we've got so much users that um, this, like, no, no one could keep keep the pace of answering these questions properly, and developers were like, "Oh, we don't like we we have to program, and then ha someone has to hold uh, the forum flood." Um, 
So it was solved with the with, with the Batman. So Batman is the saver. So the takeaway from here is that yes, King has shared big part of internal tools, common stack, unique for studios for some of the studios as a game engine so that's the tools that king used to produce games it shared this tool is awesome for 2d cross-platform games designed to perform well on low-end devices okay this is clear as well now what i really tried to explain this is a common question like how do you conquer unity we won't conquer unity unity is awesome i mean this month as he can explain that unity is awesome he has been programming that for years and years and years eight years right <laughs> right so default is not competing with unity and with other tools default is competing with the homebrew middleware and homebrew is basically a technology that you have to use because you cannot use anything else so that's what we're competing, competing with. The next slide, the next slide. Take a moment to read it again, to digest that in memory and you know, all that. Uh, also the sausage. I mean, I don't know what, what the thing with sausage is. It's just a gift from a default website. I thought this was awkward enough uh, to land into my slides. I also I asked uh, an artist who created that, like, why sausage? He's looking at me, that's not a sausage. I'm like, oh, but, but this is, okay, if it's not a sausage, like, what's that? No. <laughs> the, be, yeah, bean, bean. No, his answer was, whatever you like. <laughs> but, like, I like sausage, but apparently, whatever I like except for sausage. Cool. Now the future. A uh, mandatory screenshot from Yira. I hope for after this uh, my talk you'll uh, use only Yira, not Jira. Uh, Codename uh, for the tool. So, the future. I've created, uh, actually uh, we have a roadmap, it's almost public, almost as in as soon as legal people read it, it's gonna go public. And um, legal people have to read the roadmap because we're king and we create games and uh, some of these games are not announced and king king is a big, big company and we're just afraid with this tool that as soon as we talk too much the media gonna make you know um, a cover story from our roadmap and so legal have to be happy with that before so in the future the future so the future is the following. Get ready for that. We want to create. We want to create a, a programming language, a new programming language designed for games, for game development. This would be highly efficient programming language. We we'll call it Sol. I don't know why, because the programmer that has been responsible for for it is on parental leave, so I cannot ask him. So the new, uh, the new game, the new programming language, that's one breaking thing. Second thing that a new editor, we wanna, we're building that based on Clojure. Are there any Java people knowing who, what clo Clojure is? No. So that's a cool technology, just like, that's a cool technology. Um, there is a video on YouTube. Why is it cool and how is it cool? Another thing that might resemble here with this auditory is we want to resurrect um, web gaming. So back in the days when Unity had a web player, everyone was creating um, Unity-based um, Facebook games and just web games, got um, auditory on the webs and uh, everyone was happy. Now you cannot pretty much create a web game with Unity, so you have to use what? What do you use to create a web game now? The next game, next generation technology called Flash. Right, so apparently there are still uh, people 
there are still enough alive people who still remember uh, how, how to do stuff with Flash. Uh, and and for it might be okay for banners, but for games it's, it's, it's very, very hard. You're very limited in what you can do with Flash. So the, there are these technologies like WebGL and like HTML5, but it's very hard to, like the tools to create like small and fast games with, uh, with the HTML5 and WebGL are either very limited or the game produced are just too large with no streaming, with no uh, fast asset loading, that you cannot create a uh, meaningful experience for that. So we're fixing that. You can try it out like today, the tool is free and all that, and see what's like how, how, how does a uh, default author uh, WebGL game performs. We're introducing Facebook payments. We're introducing uh, Facebook WebGL Canvas support. And we're, guess what? Working with Facebook to, to make Facebook great again, uh, right? So I stole the pitch, but still. And another cool thing is that we, as in I, picking a few from teams willing to take this challenge and to try out the stuff with default and will help these teams be successful somehow. For example, like we may rent a booth space at bigger conferences like GDC and invite these teams there or say we can give away say 100,000 installs on the iOS and imagine quality of the traffic by King, right? So we're still working out on you know terms and conditions, but just a sneak peek here. So if it's you, if it's you who, who's willing to try out and say, hey, can you help me be successful? I'm doing an awesome game. Then uh, go catch me. And for you to, to, di to digest the future year of slide, Here's one more video. The foal is the ability to create games cross-platform without the hassle. So, why did me and Christian make this game menu? Well, we wanted to find better ways of making games, and the tools and platforms we found on the market didn't really match what we were looking for. We had lots of ideas and thought we could realize all of them in less than a year. And that's now six years ago. It took that long because we wanted to create the right architecture from the start. Uh, design with cross-platform in mind, uh, which means that you can test your games live on your device instantly over Wi-Fi. And also to make a tool designed for both developers and designers, where designers can test their games on their own. I think default is a very good engine if you want to create a, a game quickly with few people. You can just, one programmer, one artist, create something and iterate on it and, and have a, a game very fast. I'm the lead developer of uh, Hemwatch Coliseum, which is a spin-off on the uh, PC and Mac hit Hemwatch. We actually went from starting a new project to having a prototype ready uh, in less than three or four hours. And now we're releasing the fold free of charge, so you're welcome to test it to create your game. Yada yada, correct. So uh, this was actually all what I wanted to say you. And there is a Twitter handle, so you should follow me because I tweet pictures and kittens. Um, and now there is a t-shirt giveaway saga. Let's start with ladies. So let's start with ladies. I have two S and one M, so one is for medium lady and two for small ladies. So if ladies have questions, then ask them, otherwise here are the t-shirts. <laughs> I'm biased. No? Okay. So let's give away this just because you're ladies. So, <laughs> so who's medium lady? Do you have me? Medium lady. Okay, that's yours. Uh, small ladies? Small lady? Okay, go gra grab that. So, medium lady, that's medium. 
whoops, I broke something. Um, okay, it won't be that easy with the rest. It's small and medium anyways, so you have to be small or medium for that. So, but no, seriously, do you have questions? Otherwise, yeah, do that. Yeah, default. Uh, the, uh, the question was, uh, I guess, why default is not open source? Um, since that's a quite often question, the reason for that is, in order to open source stuff, you have to work with legal team so much that you don't want to do that, because you have to prove that each line of code is open sourceable, that each line of code would work with this very with this quite hard and complex license. So, and I mean, um, we just wanted to kind of give, give away this engine and uh, hope there is attraction uh, and, and people would just use that. And uh, I mean, we'll see how the engine solve current problems of the industry. And uh, like open sourcing it, it just would take so much time and efforts that it wouldn't be, you know, feasible for us. From my eye, you're an M, right? Okay, we need some smaller people because <laughs> here. What about smaller people? Otherwise, you'll have to give this away to your girlfriend. Yeah. So uh, that's a great question. Is the engine 2D only? No, it's not 2D only. However, King mostly creates 2D games. So that's why the tooling behind the engine is 2D. The engine itself is 3D. You can import Collada. Now we're working on FBX Impeter. So you can import the 3D mesh, but you would have to use Lua scripting to operate with the mesh. You wouldn't be able to import materials. You wouldn't be able to import animations. You would have to do animations in spine, and uh, that's it. So like, if you really need a 3D character, like if you have a very complex animation and you're not into uh, drawing 1,000 million sprites, you just import the 3D mesh and operate with that. Uh, but we will get better at some point with the 3D things. We won't, you know, uh, position ourselves as a 3D engine, but we'll get better at hanging 3D, since one of our teams decided that they want uh, to use 3D characters as buttons in the GUI. And, and they're shipping soon, and so we don't have much options. <laughs> right. Are you an S? Okay, cool. Oops, sorry. Two more. Two more smaller people. Yes, whoever is more vocal. <laughs> um, you talked a lot about uh, Unity and working in bigger teams, but why should someone, like, say, working on their own with a simpler engine like Game Maker? That's a great question, and that's what I actually. That's a, one more great question, which is which is which is very awesome. Meaning that the audience here is basically who I wanted to talk to. The simple question is: you shouldn't. Uh, the um, proper uh, the simple answer is you shouldn't. The proper answer answer is you shouldn't unless you see that our proposition is what you're missing in your technology, meaning that you would either have to improve your own technology and focus on the technology and the game, or take the existing technology that we're offering for free and we're not going like, to charge for it anyhow, and just use that. I mean, if this is what you're missing, then we'll have to talk. If this is what you're not missing, and you're like 100% happy with what, whatever you're, you, you're using, meaning, well, I mean, if you're happy, well, then you're happy. Focus on making great games. The industry needs games. The player, players need games. Everyone needs great games. And you need a t-shirt. <laughs> Sorry. And the last t-shirt, last question, I guess. Is difficult to start Great. overall or with the engine? With the engine. With the engine. So um, we have 
a guy called Mikkel Sacke. Uh, he works for... Um, actually, uh, can I tell that? I think I can. So, he's a narrative designer for the new Battlefield. We use him <laughs> for, for tutorials. Um, that's a great use of, of, of his talent, actually. Uh, no, seriously, he, he creates awesome tutorials. And um, from what I hear, Default is one of the like, best documented softwares that uh, people on the internet used. I mean, the, I, mean I read this, the comment on the internet, right? So, uh, actually, people are happy about uh, documentary we have. We have video tutorials, we have like, lessons, we have demo projects. So, if you're fine with Lua, or uh, if you can script, and by the way, all the artists in the room, I see there is more artists, a uh, lot of artists in the room. So you're screwed, you're all screwed. You cannot use the engine without programmer. Uh, you have to script, you have to script in Lua. We didn't have this ambition like to create a, a, another game maker or game salad. We had an ambition of creating like the engine that you need some experience to use. And this is uh, and, and the engine has like lots of fixed things and limitations, and meaning that li fixes, as in like fixed number of vertices, uh, it can render unless you know where to edit stuff. That's a long answer. This, the short answer would be: it's easy to start if you know something about game development. It should be hard if you cannot code overall. And don't and are not willing to learn and uh, and yeah, so pretty much it. Let me check if I have something else. Uh, we're two minutes over, anyways. Now I don't have any more t-shirts. So we're two minutes over. You have t-shirts. We had nice questions. We had nice presentations. So now you can clap. <laughs>